Thank you all for joining our webinar on maternal and child health. The title of our webinar is Maternal Health 101. We have three main goals with this webinar. One, to give you a basic introduction to the topic of maternal and child health. Two, to explore what the Bible says about women's health. And three, to get suggestions of ways that United Methodist women can begin to act to support mother and child health needs in their communities. So some of you may have been at assembly last year, and you may have heard United Methodist women talk about abundant health for women and children. Again, I'll repeat the name of the program, Abundant Health for Women and Children. So this is a new initiative that we announced last year at Assembly, um, encouraging all United Methodist women to act to support mother and child health needs. But why is it important for an organization like United Methodist Women to work on maternal health? We are working on this issue because it is a crisis that needs our attention. You may have heard in the news that the U.S. has the highest rate of maternal and infant mortality of all developed countries in the world today. In the United States, about 700 women die every year when they become pregnant or go into give birth. We have nearly 23,000 newborns who die before their first birthday. So we are very lucky today to have with us two women's health leaders who have been on the ground in communities working to end maternal and child mortality. We have Ms. Tanya Elkins, who is the director of Vanderbilt School of Nursing's Maternal Infant Health Outreach Worker Program, which is a program that trains local women to mentor new mothers in their communities. And Tanya will tell us more about her program. We also have the amazing Katie Zer, who is the project director of the Healthy Families, Healthy Planet Initiative of the General Board of Church and Society of the United Methodist Church. Katie has also been on the ground mobilizing church women to advocate for maternal health needs both here in the U.S. and around the world. And my name is Dana Ikriamwa. I work with United Methodist Women and my focus is on maternal health both here in the U.S. and around the world. So I'm very grateful to have these wonderful ladies, wonderful experts with us today to help us understand what maternal health is, what God says about women's health, and how United Methodist women can get involved. I'll now turn the mic over to Tanya, who will introduce herself and share with us what mother and child health means and why it's an important issue. Thanks, Donna. Um, we're excited to be here today. As Donna said, I'm the director of my How at Vanderbilt School of Nursing. Um, you can find more um, out about us at our website here, www.myhow.org. Um, but we, we are a peer mentoring organization where we train local community women um, to go into the homes of other women and help them have a healthy per pregnancy and prepare for bringing their children home and um, help them develop in those early years. Um, we've worked with um, Redburn Mission and Henderson Settlement in Frakes, Kentucky, where they do a um, home visiting program using the MyHow curriculum. We work in West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Mississippi in both urban and rural areas um, to do both our home visiting program and to conduct pregnancy and first-year parenting support groups. So thank you for having us today. Um, what I'm going to cover, as Donna said, is um, what we mean when we say maternal, infant, and child health. So I'm just going to start with um, a few definitions. Usually when we talk about maternal health as opposed to just women's health, we're focusing on women um, in 
childbearing age, which is roughly ages 15 to 39. And I know that encompasses a big age range, um, but maternal health focuses on things related to childbearing, which means health before pregnancy, throughout a pregnancy, and postpartum. And so even before a teen, um, even before a woman gets pregnant, which may be in her teenage years, um, we're thinking about her general physical health and her reproductive health, um, social emotional health, that's going to help her as she grows to um, have healthy pregnancy and good childbearing years. When we talk about infant health, um, sometimes we are talking about even before the baby's born, but generally infant health refers to those first 12 months of a child's life, and we're talking about their physical and their brain and social development. Um, so a lot is happening those first 12 months in infant health. And then child health usually we use to refer to health from age one until a child reaches adolescence. And for early childhood purposes, the focus is up to kindergarten, um, although in a lot of home visiting programs, such as my how, um, the focus is on children ages 0 to 3, which would be before they go into um, pre-K or um, some kind of daycare environment like Head Start. So those are the basics of maternal, infant, and child health as we refer to them during this webinar um, and in general when you hear them talked about in the community. Um, so why is maternal, infant, and child health important? Um, why is it important to us in the United States and why is it important um, to United Methodist Women? I guess why should it be important to us as a society? Um, and I'm going to talk about the economic, physical, and societal costs um, of having poor health. And um, generally, when we talk about preconception health or maternal health, um, the result of poor maternal health is that we have poor birth outcomes, which means um, a baby might be born premature or uh, might be born of low birth weight, which are the two that I'm going to focus on, but um, also might be born with other health problems. When we look at the economic costs of having poor birth outcomes, they are um, pretty high. Last estimate I read was like $26 billion. Um, the a report here shows from March of Dimes in 2008 um, that the cost of having a premature or low birth weight baby um, could be 10 times more than having an uncomplicated delivery. And so those costs would um, include not just the delivery and maybe a stay in a NICU, um, but also through that first year of life of getting that baby caught up hopefully and healthy um, to where he or she needs to be. Um, so there are costs to us, the taxpayers, through paying um, for health insurance, um, and then there are also costs to businesses, costs to the government, who's, um, providing a lot of insurance also. So um, apart from the economic costs, there are also costs to um, the baby physically, short and long-term effects of being born early or being born weighing too little. And those costs, um, the extremity of those would depend on both how little the baby weighed at birth and how premature that the baby was. Um, but some of the costs associated with those two conditions are difficulty breastfeeding, um, being able to latch on, um, also, children can be more susceptible to infections, can have both short and long-term lung and breathing problems, can experiencing, experience learning delays, especially when they get to school, and um, can also suffer some, from some behavioral issues, um, most notably ADHD. And again, not every child is going to experience these. Um, but when we look at babies born in general, these are some of the things that we see. Um, the other costs that I'd like to talk about for a minute are societal effects. And so this doesn't just hit the pocketbook or just hit medically, but also uh, when families have a child that's in the NICU for a long time 
or bring home a baby that has long, um, long-term effects of poor birth outcomes, we see ongoing stress on the family. And that can be from missed work, that can be from having to go to a lot of doctor's appointments, um, it can be from having to learn how to take care of a baby that has special needs. Um, but when we have a family member who has a lot of health issues, um, at any age, we know that it can contribute to the ongoing family stress. Um, also, as noted, there are more special needs among babies who are born um, with poor birth outcomes, and our education system reports that special needs student enrollment is increasing, um, and they are trying to figure out how do we support um, more kids that have special needs. And then um, another societal effect is that we are um, perpetuating health disparities that already exist. Um, as Donna mentioned, our um, infant mortality rate in the U.S. Um, is behind those of other industrialized nations, um, but those higher rates are almost entirely due to high mortality among less advantaged groups. And when we say less advantaged groups, um, primarily we're looking at groups that are minorities in the United States or have a lower um, economic status in the United States. Um, but I know um, in the state of Tennessee where I live, it's um, our African American babies that are born um, are almost twice as likely to die as their white counterparts. And so um, the health disparities are really great when we look at this issue. Um, so if we move on to look at um, what health risks that we can see in the mom um, when she's pregnant that can affect the outcome of the baby. Um, some of these are here on the slide, hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, depression, genetic conditions, STDs, tobacco and alcohol use, inadequate nutrition, and an unhealthy weight. And so looking at all of those things, um, those are things that if we start working with teens um, before they're actually childbearing and we're addressing these issues, there's a lot that we can do to prevent or treat um, these things that could then contribute to a healthier pregnancy when she begins having children. Um, apart from the things listed on these slides, there are other factors that will, uh, will affect the health um, of both the mom and the baby. Um, as I said, race and ethnicity, um, we have a lot of health disparities in the United States um, between Caucasian and African American and um, some that we're also seeing among Hispanic families, but especially when we look at infant mortality and low birth weight, um, African Americans fare far worse. And um, when we look at mother's age, if women have children early in their teens or then after their mid-30s, um, we have increased rates of not having um, good outcomes. Family income, um, the lower your socioeconomic status, um, the greater risk you are to have a poor birth outcome. The environment that you're in, if it's full of chemicals or smoke from cigarettes or um, if you're in an environment where there's a meth lab, different things like that can um, obviously affect health. And then the last thing is access to quality care. What we find um, anecdotally through our groups is that when moms are on Medicaid, and they're receiving prenatal care, they're not always given the same options or the same time and attention that women who have private insurance are given by their health care providers. And that can ultimately lead to poor outcomes. So um, as we look at maternal, infant, and child care um, across the spectrum in the United States, um, there are a few issues that are important right now that people are really paying attention to. And so I want to bring those to your attention. The first that we've already mentioned is infant mortality. 
um, and that's the death of an infant within the first year of life. Um, and that can be due to any number of reasons. The biggest reason um, is to have some kind of congenital um, defect, um, like a heart defect or something, where that are not always easy to prevent. Um, but there are other reasons that um, we have infants dying before they reach their first birthday. And so um, a lot of what you'll hear is um, funding going to try and decrease the, uh, the rate of infant mortality in the United States. Um, breastfeeding, also um, a big issue you may hear in the news about people promoting public breastfeeding or not promoting public breastfeeding. Uh, my how believes women should be able to breastfeed everywhere um, and we know that breast milk is the best thing for babies. So um, that's an issue that you'll see in your communities and in the news. Safe sleep practices, right now there's a big safe sleep campaign across the United States. Um, when we look at infant mortality, we see that SIDS is going down, which is unknown cause of infant mortality, but we see that um, babies dying in unsafe sleep situations has been um, increasing. And um, that's also increasing among our minority populations at a higher rate um, than among our white population. And so um, that's something that's definitely preventable through um, education and strong practice. Um, family planning is on the list because um, not only in the United States but in other parts of the world, um, we see that women are not always taking advantage or do not have access to contraception and um, women should wait about 18 months with, between babies to give their bodies time to get ready to have another baby um, and that's not always happening. We know that in the United States about half of pregnancies are unplanned um, and so that doesn't just affect the um, mom's health but there can be financial issues and other things that are affected through a lack of family planning. And then um, other things that, that you'll see in the news are um, workplace laws and hospital policies. And both of those have been um, moving towards the better, in my opinion. Um, workplace laws now provide the time for women to have breaks for breastfeeding. They're not all the same in all the states, um, but you could check that out in your area. Um, we want women to be able to take breaks at work to, bre to pump breast milk or breastfeed their baby if that's a possibility. Um, and then hospitals are becoming part of the baby friendly initiative, making their hospitals more baby friendly um, and that includes the promotion of breastfeeding and um, rooming in, keeping the babies close to their moms, different things like that that can promote health. Um, so that's kind of a, a run through of some of the issues that you might see and um, a general overview of maternal infant child health in the United States. Thank you, Tanya. You've given us very good information. I think from your presentation, now I understand what age groups are covered under maternal, infant, child health. Um, I think you helped us also to understand that when one mother is not healthy, we all pay, in a sense. As taxpayers, the next generation of babies pay, you know, in terms of what health they enjoy. I think you've also brought to attention some important issues that we should pay attention to. You know, what breastfeeding policies exist in our workplace, how hospitals are friendly to babies, whether family planning exists for women. So thank you. I think this has been a very good introduction to maternal health for us. We'll now turn to Katie, who works primarily with the church when it comes to maternal health. Katie, so growing up, I didn't really hear my pastors talk a lot about maternal health. That, what does God and what does the Bible say about maternal health? Can you give us a little overview? Thanks, Donna. And I'm saddened but not surprised that this isn't an issue that you heard about growing up in church. But um, I have good news that 
the Bible has a lot to say when we're talking about uh, maternal health and caring for moms and their families. And I just want to echo your thanks to Tanya for laying out a really wonderful overview of the public health reasons that we all should care about maternal and child health. But I want to turn us to talking about what does a theology of maternal health look like. Um, when I started Healthy Families, Healthy Planet for the General Board of Church and Society back in 2010, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, um, I had a vision that the United Methodist Church could become a denomination that would speak boldly about what I call the moral tragedy of women dying in childbirth. Uh, Donna, you shared at the beginning that in the U.S. about, I think it was 700 women die every year um, from maternal health complications. But for when we're talking about the globe, it's actually 800 women every day, um, and mostly from preventable causes. So for me, this is a moral tragedy because we know what we need to do to save women's lives. We just have failed to act in certain parts of the world. So before I could start this advocacy campaign uh, and build a movement for maternal health within the church, I first had to stop and wrap my mind around why the church should care about the issue. And before that, ask myself, did God care about maternal health? And I believe that the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Yes, God cares deeply about maternal health because God cares about women and girls. When we look over our collective history as, as a world, as a Christian community, um, it's not hard for us to see the many ways that women are devalued in our society. Um, but the truth is that God made women and men equally in the Imago Dei, the image of God that we learn about in the creation story in the first chapter of Genesis. So being made in the image of God means that women, just like men, have innate sacred worth as created beings, and they have that sacred worth apart from whatever roles that they might play in society, including the role of mother. And this runs counter to that collective history uh, and the present reality in which women still are so often reduced to, to their reproductive organs, either to be put on a pedestal or to be condemned. So it's really important when we start talking about maternal health in the church that we're remembering the full humanity of women and girls, um, that their experiences of pregnancy and birth and motherhood are in the context of their full lives as human beings. Another sacred truth that we like to talk about, and I'm so pleased to hear, is, is forming the uh, title of your new initiative, is that of Christ's abundant life. Verse, uh, John verses 10.10, 10, that I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Now, when I was growing up in southeast Georgia, I grew up in an evangelical church, and I remember hearing this verse talked about a lot. Um, but that abundant life meant eternal life. And whether or not it was said uh, explicitly, it meant exclusively the life after our physical lives on earth. But in my advocacy work, I've come to reclaim that verse, to have a broader understanding of what Jesus is saying here, and I truly believe that the abundant life he brings is to be experienced here and now in this life. When a mother dies in childbirth because she couldn't access health care, this is a moral tragedy, and it's in direct conflict with this promise of Jesus that we all claim. A woman who dies in childbirth isn't able to experience that gift of earthly abundant life, and it's almost guaranteed that the child that she birthed won't experience abundant life either because, as we know from what Tanya shared with us, the health of a child is so inextricably linked to the health of the mother. So we know from our shared biblical tradition that God cares about women and girls and that Christ promised abundant life for all. But we also know from our lived experience that oftentimes women aren't treated as having sacred worth and are valued only for their ability to, go, to bear children. We also know that bearing children for so many women is life-threatening and can stand in the way of her experiencing Christ's promise. What does this mean for us as the church? How does this change the ways that we interact with our world? The question that arose for me in thinking about that, and the question that we often use in our work at Healthy Families, Healthy Planet, and more broadly at the General Board of Church and Society is, what would the church look like if women and girls were seen as children of God with sacred word? What would the world look like 
if women and girls were seen as children of God with sacred worth? What would happen if we were to ask God to open our eyes so that we might see that sacred worth in all of God's children, especially women and girls who are often the most marginalized? I wanted to show these two pictures. The one on the left is from a trip I took to Malawi in 2011. And these were young girls who were the daughters of women who had just graduated from a tailoring school. And they were there to sing and dance for the graduation celebration, and they were modeling some of the clothes that their mothers had sewn throughout that year of their study. But now as I reflect on that picture, I think four years has passed since I went on that trip, and many of these girls are adolescents now, and I worry about them. I worry about their futures. They live in a country where maternal mortality continues to claim the lives of thousands of women every year, and I wonder what will happen to them when they have children, or if they've already had children. Will they be able to get the kind of care that they need before, during, and after their pregnancies and births? Uh, and will their sons and daughters have the opportunity to know them? Now the picture on the right is of my cute little daughter, Samantha, who just turned seven months last week. I can hardly believe it. Um, and when I got pregnant with her, I was faced with my own privilege in a way that I was really forced to examine and to unpack. And I saw how much access I'd had throughout my entire life to education, to medical care, to all kinds of resources, and that I had the ability to choose my partner in the time in my life when I was ready to get married. And when we decided we were ready to have a child and I got pregnant with my daughter, it was a cause for celebration and joy um, for me and for my family. And we weren't afraid. We weren't afraid that I wouldn't be able to get prenatal care or have a qualified health worker attend the birth or that I would have some kind of complication for which nothing could be done. And all of that was determined by my geography and my economic status. That experience of having a pregnancy go so well and having such wonderful care really reaffirmed my commitment to ensuring that every woman, no matter where she lives, has access to good maternal health care so that she can watch her children grow up and that her family can experience that life of abundance that Christ offers to all of us. Now I want to talk a little bit about the project that I direct, Healthy Families, Healthy Planet. We are a grassroots advocacy initiative, and our mission is to improve global maternal health through advocating for more funding and better policies that support health programs that benefit women and their children, including access to voluntary family planning. And when I talk about it being grassroots, I really mean grassroots. We are rooted in the local church. And when I started the project, it was brand new. I didn't have a whole list of committed people I could call to get this thing off the ground. So I began the work of building a movement from scratch, one conversation at a time. And many of the people I talked with early on were wonderful United Methodist women uh, who helped me build this, build this initiative for the church. Over time, we've built up a great network, and I would call it even a family, of trained volunteers, more than 130 folks throughout the United States um, who are our ambassadors. Since 2011, we've conducted six advocacy trainings, and we're preparing to do a seventh this summer. Um, and these are opportunities to connect people of faith to the advocacy work that Healthy Families, Healthy Planet is doing. And what's so great about these trainings is that it's a time of forming community in addition to building skills and increasing knowledge, providing that space for advocates to come together to share their passions and stories and connect with one another over a common goal is what keeps this initiative vibrant and growing. Like I said, we, we've trained more than 130 folks to be Healthy Families, Healthy Planet Ambassadors from across 20 states, a lot of whom are United Methodist women, and they are doing the work of organizing and advocating within their communities for the sacred work of women and girls. And I'll talk a little bit later on about how you all can get involved with the Ambassador Program. Amazing, Katie. I can't believe how much work you've done in the church. Over what, a hundred events focused on maternal health and bringing up this bold conversation that God recognizes both men and women as full human beings of sacred worth. Thank you for your inspiring work. 
So we now move on to our discussion piece. The main question that our members have for both Katie and for Tanya. What can church women do to improve mother and child health? I think you've touched on it a little bit, but I'll give you the chance to go in deeper. Where do we start as church women? So I've got several ideas of, about how um, community women can really affect health. Um, and a lot of those that come out of the MyHow program, things that work for us in the communities where um, we serve. The first thing always is to find out what's going on um, in your local community. So um, we work in both urban and rural areas, and we find that in some of our urban areas there are a lot of resources. Um, and in some of our areas there are not very many resources. And sometimes there are resources that are not being accessed um, effectively. And so the first thing is to find out what home visiting programs are available to women or um, what is the situation with prenatal care? Um, what does my health department provide for women? Um, how are women getting um, added to the network to receive health insurance during their pregnancy? Um, those kind of things. And then also the churches can connect to those resources um, in either an informal or a formal way to partner. Um, if you contact your local health department and find out that there are specific needs or your local clinics and find out that they're doing the pregnancy tests and want to um, offer your church as a resource for women to um, be able to get information or get material resources, um, the first thing is to be connected. And um, sometimes those nonprofit agencies that are providing support or um, even governmental agencies um, have advisory boards and things where they're looking for community women to help them figure out how to best serve the target population. Um, among our churches and among our communities, we can promote healthy lifestyle choices. So um, I would say starting, you know, as early as possible, but definitely in those teen years um, where they start to become of childbearing age to make sure that we're promoting good nutrition and exercise um, among those women so that they, before they get pregnant, have um, a healthy lifestyle that can um, lead to healthy pregnancy later. We can also promote breastfeeding in a number of ways among our congregation. We can make our church um, a place where breastfeeding is appropriate and um, invited. We can make a special place maybe, um, a special nursing room if that's appropriate at your church. Um, but also I would say just within your communities to, to really promote the, the healthy lifestyle. Um, some churches or community groups like, might like to provide material support. You could have a diaper drive um, or have a baby shower where everyone comes and brings gifts and then all of those gifts are locate, are donated to a local organization who can use those. Um, it might be appropriate for you all to have um, a table at a health fair where you can find out what women need and see how you can meet that need. Um, education um, sometimes is the thing that's needed in your community. Um, MyHow provides a curriculum and a model for home visiting and we're always looking for new partners, be they agencies or churches, to partner with us to train community health workers, um, those peer mentors who can help um, pregnant women have the best pregnancy they can and support those early years of childhood. Um, and then we also have pregnancy and first year parenting group curriculums and a model. Um, so we're happy to partner with UMW members in that way. And the last thing is to advocate. Um, depending on where um, other health workers work, they may not be able to, within their positions, um, advocate with the legislature, but um, as members of the community and taxpayers, we can call, write, and visit our lawmakers and tell them we support programs that provide home visits to young families or we support um, being able to breastfeed in public areas. Um, anything that will help promote the health in our community of those organizations. 
Thank you, Tanya. So I'm hearing three things. Reach out beyond the walls of the church. Find out what's going on in your community. Then reach in. Make better choices for yourself and teach these healthier choices to women in your community. And thirdly, speak up. Share what you know. Speak up to leaders. Tell them to make good choices when it comes to laws that affect women and children. These are very good suggestions. So Katie, do you have any other suggestions for us? Yes, well I'm so glad that Tanya talked a little bit about advocacy and that's what mm -hmm. my work focuses on. Um, like I said earlier, United Methodist Women are already doing this important work um, through Healthy Families, Healthy Planet. We have a lot of United Methodist Women who are part of our ambassador program who are doing amazing work at the local level. So I would just say if you all are interested in joining the Healthy Families, Healthy Planet ambassador program, um, I'd love to talk with you about the possibility of hosting one of our advocacy trainings in your annual conference. We're always looking to expand, always thinking what the next place could be where we could build a new network of folks focused on this issue. So I would just say to, uh, if you're interested in that, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, you'll get my email at the end of the webinar. Um, but for everybody, I would encourage you to visit our website, umchealthyfamilies.org. We have lots of resources that you can use in your congregation, including Bible studies and prayers that are focused on this topic of the sacred worth of women and girls. Um, great ways to introduce your congregation to the issue from a theological perspective. We also have an opportunity on the website to write your elected officials about the importance of investing in maternal health programs. You just click the Take Action tab on the far right of the menu bar and you can write a letter today. And of course, we hope you'll keep up with us on social media. We have a Facebook page and a Twitter handle. You can keep up with all the work that we're doing. Um, we'd love for you to join us in that way. Thank you, Katie. It seems you have many resources available, and I would encourage United Methodist Women to connect to Healthy Families, Healthy Planet, or to the My Health program to get your, your local group jump-started on these issues. So next, we move to frequently asked questions. Whenever we talk about maternal health, some women have reservations. They wonder, well, I'm not a woman of reproductive age. I may be younger than 15, which I think is the beginning age that Tanya mentioned. Or I may be older than 39. I may be beyond my reproductive age. Or I may be a non-biological mother. Maybe I adopted a child. Where do I fit in into these issues? So my question for you, Tanya, is how can we support the health needs of non-traditional caregivers? So um, again, the first thing I would say is to um, find out kind of what's going on among the target population that you're working with. Um, I think with um, most adopted moms that I've met, there is sometimes this um, feeling from other people of like you're not really a mom and I would um, discourage any ideas of that greatly that um, adopted mothers I find in my experience have often waited even longer than nine months like um, a biological mother would to have their babies and they have the exact same concerns and issues um, and so that we would develop just embrace I guess any any mother or any person who's taking care of babies in the same way um, and then as far as like aunts or grandmothers or um, granddads or friends of family members who are taking care of them um, a couple things one is that um, having a child if you didn't expect it can be a great expense and there is often material support that you might be able to provide and so um, just to ask people I guess what their needs are and to think um, if you're a mother when you have the greatest needs um, if you need help in the summer with childcare or um, if you need help with finances when um, your kids go back to school in the fall to think that alternative caregivers 
are probably having those same needs. Um, and also that a lot has changed in maternal, infant, and child health um, since the last generation. And so um, if you are um, a current mother or parent and um, you are kind of up on the latest research and you're working with someone who may not be that you could um, offer advice in a kind way or um, offer to do things. I know car seats have changed a lot and if you know how to install a car seat you can offer um, a grandmother to install the car seats correctly for the grandchildren that she's taking care of um, or to think to contact um, your local Department of Children's Services, DCS office. Um, lots of times they are working with foster care children who are in the care of alternative caregivers like um, grandmothers and aunts. And um, they may have some specific needs that they know about that your church or your group might be able to support. Thank you, Tanya, for reminding us to be sensitive to the needs of non-traditional mothers. And Katie, I know you work with both women and men as well. What role do you see that men can play? And overall, do you have any suggestions for the church beyond just United Methodist Women? Thanks, Donna. We do have uh, a few amazing male ambassadors who um, speak from the perspective as fathers and husbands, which is a really important perspective to be brought to the issue of maternal health. I think so often um, maternal health can be talked about as if it's just a women's issue when it's really an issue that affects everybody. And we need men to use their voices to lift up maternal health in the public square. Like I said, talking about maternal health from the perspective of, of a son or a father or even a grandfather can be really powerful, especially when we're talking with elected officials who might also be men. So I would just encourage um, our men to get involved with Healthy Families, Healthy Planet. Come to one of our ambassador trainings. We would love to have you be part of our work. And more broadly for the church, I think it's just so important for us to um, translate what our values are into action that we take and to think about the ways that we can lift up what's going on in your local community to what's happening around the globe. And don't be afraid to start with something small, but don't end there either. And I would just encourage you all to see Healthy Families, Healthy Planet as a resource to help you navigate that journey, that marathon of advocacy. We're here to be a resource and would love to connect with you. Thank you. And Tanya, I know you also work with the family as a whole. Do you have any suggestions of the role men can play? Yes, we um, invite um, all family members to our pregnancy and parenting groups and we have had um, men participate and they always um, bring something to the mix that we um, haven't necessarily expected and men are so vital to um, the health of their families. We know with breastfeeding that one of the primary determinants of if a woman will have a successful breastfeeding experience is if her significant other supports her and so um, that's directly um, playing into the support of his baby to support the mother. Um, we know how important it is to have a strong family unit um, and we know that uh, men interact with their infants and their children in ways that moms don't that um, promote um, different skills and different ways of looking at the world and so um, we always want to include men in any education that we're giving um, and offer them support as well. We don't always, um, as a culture, expect men to know about parenting and so um, they don't always engage if they don't feel like they know what they're doing and so um, I would encourage you to jump in there and invite men and expect them to be participatory and um, they, they always show up and surprise me so um, I guess that's it. Thank you. So open up the spaces to men, open up the spaces to non-traditional caregivers. As Katie reminded us, we are all created in the image of God and we can all do something to help maternal health.
Thank you so much, ladies, for sharing your knowledge, your experience, your passion with us today. I think we've all learned a lot, and we are inspired by your commitment to the issue. I see myself going from here and trying to do more because I know that I can do what you have also done. Um, so if you wish to reach out to Tanya and to Katie or to me, here is our contact information. Tanya can be reached at Tanya, T-O-N-Y-A dot Elkins, E-L-K-I-N-S at Vanderbilt dot E-D-U. Katie can be reached at K-Z-E-H at U-M-C dash G-B-C-S dot org. And I can be reached at D-A-K-U-A-M-O-A-H at United Methodist Women dot org. Feel free to reach out to us and please go out there. We are looking forward to hearing your stories of the amazing things you are doing to support mother and child health. So until our next webinar, thank you for joining us and we look forward to hearing the fruits of your successes for women and children's health.